Father, we thank you for the blessed privilege to gather together as a church this morning to sing praises to your name and to worship and to glorify you and to encourage one another in your word. And I ask that you would be with this time in the scripture as we turn to consider the teaching of First Peter, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us understanding and insight into the text. And that, Father, you would change us, that we would be more like the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would be more glorifying to you and bring honor to your name. And it's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. A particularly glorious aspect of the biblical message is that once God has entered into a saving relationship with us, once he has redeemed us in Christ, we are then described as his treasured possession. We are described as his chosen people, those who are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Uh, This is on the basis of the work that he has done, that we have had the work of Christ given to us. And as a basis of this relationship with God, we are completely changed. There must be a change in how we act. There must be a change in how we live, all because God himself has brought that change into us. Imagine a husband and wife or a man and a woman getting married. And then they leave the wedding going back to their individual homes as though they were still single for the rest of their lives. That's completely ridiculous because entering into the marriage relationship changes their lives drastically. And so also the reality that God has brought us to himself, that he has changed us from being dead in sin to alive in Christ, that we actually know God, that changes us altogether. And this reality of transformation, it leads us to go out and to proclaim the glories of Christ, to preach the gospel to those who are lost and to have every aspect of our lives in submission to him. We're going to see Peter continue and to develop these themes on the basis of what we have been working through. And he's going to to give us the call here that on the basis of who we are in Christ, we are to preach his glory. And so I want you to look with me at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10 this morning. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here we begin to see the fundamental way that Peter describes the New Testament Christians in terms of their identity. In verses 7 through 8 of chapter 2, he has just described those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And he starts off here in our passage this morning in verse 9 with the word, but. uh, Demonstrating that there is a clear and there is a distinct difference between those who are lost, who have rejected the Lord, as opposed to those who have submitted to Christ and who know him. Uh, There is a powerful and a distinct difference between those who are lost and those who are saved. We saw that reality playing itself out last Sunday evening when we looked at verses 4 through 8 of this chapter. We saw that those who are unbelievers, they will suffer shame before the judgment seat of God. While we are redeemed by the blood of Christ, we will be given a position of honor because of the Lord's work on our behalf. Because we have had our sins covered in his blood and he has given us his righteousness. And so now Peter, he is drawing out these distinctions and he is showing us who we are in Christ. He moves on to show us the purpose that we have and the final reality that all of this is because of the mercy of God. And first we have our identity in the Lord. He starts off by saying that we as believers, we are a chosen race. The reality of the plan of God is all over chapter 2. And specifically the plan of God in redeeming his people. In verse 8, Peter discussed the fact that unbelievers stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. 
And here this morning, we see the fact that we are a chosen race. And Peter here is echoing back to the Old Testament. He's echoing back to the description of the nation of Israel, that they were the chosen nation of God. They were the chosen people of God. Uh, For example, if you go back to Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, It says, For you are a people, holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And so we see here the blessing that was given to the nation of Israel, that they had a distinct role to play in God's plan. Uh, The prophet Isaiah also uses very similar language. For example, in Isaiah 41.8, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, Isaiah 44, 1, but now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. And so we see a lot of similarity here between how the Old Testament describes Israel and how Peter here, writing in his first epistle, how he addresses the believers in Christ. That just as Israel was chosen by God, used by God, so we, as believers in Christ, we are chosen by him, built up into his glorious bride, the church. That is the clear parallel that Peter is wanting us to understand. That he's wanting us to know our Old Testaments and to understand that he is echoing back to this specific language. It is the amazing plan of God unfolding over history. That you had Abraham being chosen in the Old Covenant. And God promises Abraham that his seed, uh, that he would be given a mighty seed that would be as many as the sand on the shore and that he would be the father of a multitude of nations. Uh, But it wasn't just the fact that God would work through Abraham's physical seed, uh, that he would bring about the Messiah through the Jews. It was also that he would have a spiritual seed for not all the Jews truly worship God. Uh, Not everyone who was... uh, Abraham's lineage was a follower of Yahweh, for example, Ishmael, for example, Esau. But you had the promised reality that Christ would come fulfilling the demands of the law given by God to the Israelites by Moses at Sinai. And so you have Christ coming and he fulfills the law. He is the promised seed of Abraham. He is the heir to the Davidic throne. And so now no longer living on this side of the cross, it is no longer about one nation. It is about the church being built up among all the peoples, among all the nations. That God isn't just working through one group of people known as the Jews. Is that the people of God, uh, they are the church across the entire world. And Peter is using this Old Testament language to show us the glory and the magnificence of the church. That the heirs to the eternal kingdom of God, uh, the heirs to the covenant given to Abraham, are not his physical descendants, but the spiritual ones who have been given eternal life in Christ. This has been God's plan all along. For we are a chosen race. God has been working throughout history to bring about this plan according to his own holy will for his glory. Uh, these two little words, chosen race, uh, have profound theological implications. And you and I, we should stand amazed at the fact that we have been given this great blessing. Uh, that we have been given the great blessing to be a part of the people of God. It is an honor, it is a privilege, it has been bestowed upon us by the mercy of God. And next we see that Peter says we are a royal priesthood. Now back whenever we discussed verse 5, we talked about the priesthood of the believers, uh, where we see the phrase holy priesthood in that text. All of us have access before God because of the work of Christ, because he has made atonement for our sins, we all have access to the heavenly throne. That's why we don't have to make atonement with the blood of animals. It's why we don't need a priest, because our priest reigns at the right hand of the Father, having made the once-for-all sacrifice. So we affirm the priest of all believers, meaning that if you know Christ, you can come before the throne of God. But I want you to notice how here in this passage, the word royal is used to describe that priesthood. And this is back from Exodus 19 verse 5 through 6. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. 
and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. A kingdom of priests, that is the wording that is being pointed back to, and we're talking about a royal priesthood. Obviously, we know that Jesus Christ is the king. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 talks about him having all the authority in heaven and on earth. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 says that he is reigning at the right hand of the Father, making his enemies a footstool for his feet. Uh, we as his saints, we are given the promise not only that we are redeemed by Christ, but also that we will reign in the eternal kingdom with our Lord. 1 Corinthians 6 mentions our involvement in the judgment. And both Revelation 5.10 and 26 discuss our reign with the Lord himself. And so we, as the body of believers, our calling is to focus on advancing Christ's kingdom by proclaiming his gospel, by preaching the entirety of God's word, by living in obedience to it, and by urging every single person to do the same. That's why if you go back through the book of Acts, you see references to the kingdom of God, his reign and his rule. For example, in Acts 8, 12, But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And so Philip goes out preaching the message of God's kingdom and preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that is the way that the kingdom advances, the proclamation of Christ, the proclamation of the gospel. And so we are royal priests. This language used by Peter it is referencing the fact that we are a part of God's kingdom, that we have a responsibility to go out declaring this message. Believers have bowed before the Lord, and since that is the case, whatever you do, you must honor him as king, understanding that you have been justified by him, that you have been made holy by him. And we are called to use our lives as believers for his glory. And next, notice this phrase here, a holy nation. We saw that wording used also in Exodus 19, 6, whenever I read that a little bit ago. If you think back to the way that Israel was blessed in the Old Covenant, they were called out from among the peoples of the earth, that they were given the law, that they were to abide by, and they were called to be holy before God. In other words, they were called to be different. They were called to be set apart from the rest of the nations. How they conducted themselves and everything from the civil government uh, down to matters of worship and family life, it was called to be distinct from the rest of the world. It was all about being completely dedicated to God, completely marked by the ways of God. We know that Israel often fell short of that mark. And we as those living in the new covenant, we are called to be God's holy people also. The church is from every nation and every tribe made up into one glorious kingdom for God's sake. Just as Israel was set apart from the ways of sinful pagans, so we also are called to live according to a different standard than the world. That is what it means to be God's holy nation. And I want you to notice the next phrase in verse 9. It says that we are a people for his own possession. And this really ties up everything that we have been talking about. Uh, that we are God's chosen people. We are His, meaning that we are seeking to live for the sake of His kingdom. Everything about us must be dedicated to bringing Him glory. Uh, this is kind of strange language, though, uh, that is being used. I mean, we live in America. We live in the land of the free. Uh, we don't practice slavery any longer, so the concept of being someone else's possession is actually foreign to us. It's not as familiar to us as it would have been to the readers of this letter in the ancient world. But what it is talking about is the fact that we have been purchased by the blood of Christ. But not only that, it doesn't just mean that we are His in terms of our obedience. It means that we are His in terms of the fact that God Himself gives us the eternal blessings. That He eternally blesses us as His people. We're given this special place by the grace of God. We are heirs to His eternal kingdom. That God would call Israel Israel, his treasured possession in Isaiah 43, 21, and Malachi 3, 17. And so it is clear that God places a high value upon those who are his. And so the fact that we are his possession it absolutely means that we obey him, yes. But it also means that he has entered into a loving relationship with us. A loving relationship with us as his church. He cares for us. He sent Christ to die for us because of his love 
love for us and that his name might be glorified. Now, this is all what is wrapped up in what it means to be his possession. Now, this is all what Peter is communicating to us. Now, these realities, they are pivotal. And Peter moves on to the point of a pressing reality at the end of this verse. He discusses the purpose that we have. The reality of our being the people of God leads us to proclaim the glories of his name. Look at the last half of verse 9. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This verse leads us to the action that results because of salvation. It shows us that once you are saved, you are in Christ, you are called to work for him. The flow of the text is that on the basis of this glorious reality, on the basis of the transformation brought about by the work of God, on the basis that you have been given these great blessings, you will then go out into the world and proclaim his glory. You proclaim his excellencies, as the English Standard Version puts it. You preach the message that he has has declared so that you might bring glory to his name. Uh, the entire point of this verse is that you, you and I cannot simply be Christians who sit on the side and do nothing. But that's going to take sacrifice, isn't it? That takes individuals who are willing to give of themselves, who are willing to fight for the eternal kingdom of Christ who are willing to pick up their cross and endure the hard work of laboring for Christ's kingdom. It's going to necessitate that you and I put a higher value on the honor of Christ's name than we do on our personal ease and our personal comfort, and even on our personal reputations. We have to have a desire to advance his kingdom more than our own pleasures and wants. And actually, the advancement, the honor of Christ. The glory of his kingdom, it must become the ultimate desire of our hearts. That's what we're striving for. That is the crucial point. That the reality of who God is, the reality of what he has done, has brought about this change in our priorities. Sinful individuals who are lost, they live for themselves. We who have been changed by Christ, we are called to live for his sake. We see an example of this. I, I think that the fact that our country and our nation is in such a great battle right now gives us a living illustration of some things in this text to ponder. Uh, we've applied biblical principles to the fact that our country is having many issues whenever we come across passages where it fits to do so. But let me ask you this. Who, who do you think has done an overall better job of practicing their beliefs? Conservatives? Not just talking about Christians specifically, I'm talking about conservatives or secular leftists. So what we're talking about in this passage is that on the basis of what we believe, it leads to transformed living. So who has done a better job practicing their beliefs, conservatives or leftists? I'm not talking about a few individuals here and there. I'm talking about on the whole, who has done a better job. It strikes me that as rotten as the beliefs of the left are, they have done a better job at least over the last few decades. Why would I say that? Well, who has the majority of the power in the government right now? The left does. Who has the majority of the power in the entertainment world right now? The left. Who has the majority of the power overall in the educational institutions? The left. They have for many, many years. It's not that every single college or every single university is a radical leftist institution, but if we look, most of them are. My point is that as, I am, as much as I am opposed to the secularists, I must admit that they have fought, and that they have fought hard for their views. And here we are as Christians, not just conservatives, but blood-bought believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and evangelicalism has largely been outworked by all of these secularists. It's a sad reality, and it is something that we will be held accountable for. Why is America in the shape that it is in? Largely because the church has neglected its duty to proclaim the greatness of Christ, to be salt and light. It's the only way you can go from being such a largely Christian country with such a Christian worldview influence to being a secular nation. And so what should we do about it? 
We should do what we're called to do as God's people. Uh, Not simply for the sake of America, but because we're actually called to be a part of this eternal kingdom. That we're called by Christ to do these things. We're called to obey His commission. We're called to repent of where we have fallen short. We're called to preach the gospel, to proclaim the word of God, and to obey it in all of life. There has to be a proclamation of the truth. Proclaim it to your friends. Proclaim it to your family members. Tell them about this glorious Christ who has transformed you. The church needs to be taking the gospel out to the lost. It needs to be holding the governing authorities responsible by declaring to them the word of God and calling on them to repent and to place faith in Christ. We see the the call for proclamation being given here by Peter in this passage. We know the will of God. We know what he has commanded of us. But the question for each one of us to answer is, will we obey it? That's something that each one of us has to ponder in our own lives. Are we being obedient in this way and in every other way to the commands of God? It's something that we each must answer, for we will stand before Christ's judgment seat and give an answer for it. We all can look at opportunities that we have had in the past to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim biblical truth, and we know that we didn't do it in that situation, and we should have. We should have spoken the truth in that scenario, and yet we must exercise real repentance and seek to be faithful in the future when we are given such opportunities. We must seek out such opportunities for the glory of the Lord. The good news is that we have all of the tools that we need. We have the sufficient scripture. We have the powerful message of the gospel. We have the the ability to proclaim the truth of Christ. All that we must do is pick up these weapons that Christ has given to us and wield them for his glory, for the good of others, for the advancement of his eternal kingdom. We are not in the darkness anymore. We are those who are called into his marvelous light, as the end of verse 9 states. That is why we are transformed to work for Christ's sake. We are in the light. We are not in the darkness anymore. Don't live like you are of the people of darkness. We are of the people of the day. And we must labor while the Lord has given us time to do so. And I want you to look at verse 10 and see how Peter wraps this all up by talking about the mercy of God. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Before we were not a part of the people of God, but now we are. Uh, That's the emphasis upon this verse. You notice how it makes a claim once you were not a people, but now. And then it says, but now. It's wanting to mark this distinction and this transition. That previously, you and I, we were under condemnation. We were under the wrath of God. We were dead in our sins. But now we have had the mercy of God demonstrated to us. We have had his mercy demonstrated to us by the work of our Lord. This is the reality for the believer. We have had mercy upon mercy upon mercy given to us by God. Not because you and I deserved it, not because we earned this, but because God has been gracious to us. He has lavished mercy upon us. We see quite the contrast for the unbeliever. It is the Christian who is a part of God's people, not the unbeliever. Therefore, all those who are lost, they do not truly know God. They have not been redeemed by the Lord. And if that is you, then you must repent. You must place faith in Christ. He is the one through whom mercy is given. You're not given this mercy just because you were born into a Christian family or you have grown up in the church all of your life. You're given this mercy one way and one way alone, and that is repentance and faith in the Lord who died and rose again. That is the only basis of receiving this mercy. Christ alone is the source of mercy from the Father's throne. Believe in him and walk in the light of his word. And we must seek to understand as believers the depth of this grace. Do you want to have more passion for serving the Lord? Do you want to have a fire in your bones for proclaiming the message of the gospel? Know more of Christ. 
no more of the depths of this grace that he has given to you. And you will overflow in your life with a joy and a passion to declare this message to others. Not only because you want to see them saved, but because you want to see the Lord who was slain receive the glory and the honor and the praise worthy of his name. That's the primary motivation. That's the primary motivation for declaring the gospel. Proclaim his gospel. Proclaim his word and call sinners to bow before King Jesus. That is what we must do. That is what Peter is wanting us to understand. On the basis of all of these blessings we have been given as God's people, how could we not go out declaring this message, seeking to bring him glory and honor? If you need to talk about anything this morning, I'll be standing up here after the service. We'd love to pray with you or to visit with you about anything that... um, you may need counsel on. It'd be my honor to do that. I'm going to ask Ms. Kelly if she would to come lead us in our closing hymn. Let's bow in a word of prayer together. Father, I thank you for the blessing that you have given to us, the grace and the mercy that you have bestowed upon us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, O oh God, for calling us as your people, for giving us this great privilege of being your people. And I ask that you would help us to live as those who have been set apart, to live as those who have been justified by your grace and to be holy as we go out into this world, that we would declare your gospel and that we would live according to your will. God, if there be any here who have not come to know you savingly, just please draw them to yourself this day. Let them live in the darkness of their sin no longer, but let them walk in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.